Um, thanks very much for, for being quite prompt. Um, we are, I'm now going to hand over to a fantastic panel of experts who we're delighted to have here in Kilkenny um, for uh, our panel discussion this morning, which seeks to explore uh, a multidisciplinary examination of the value of arts and dementia programming. We're delighted to have this panel chaired by Helen O'Donoghue this morning, who's senior curator in the Department of Education and Learning at the Irish Museum of Modern Art. And Helen has been a really a real driving force in the Azure network, and we're so glad of her experience and um, lucky to have Helen involved in the Azure network and really um, her contribution is always so significant and she has such a, a wealth of experience in this area. So I'll hand over to you Helen. Helen will chair the panel discussion. Thanks very much Barbara Ann for the very warm um, words and um, invitation to be here today. I, I think we're all really at the point where we want to open up a conversation. So what we're hoping to do with the panel now is after the three um, panelists present some ideas to us based on their experience, both professionally and personally, we will quite quickly open to the floor. So if you have questions that have been building up from Anna through Barbara Ann and through Clive's presentations, hold on to them and we'll have a good discussion in a few moments. I'm delighted to be um, on this, chairing this panel with three people who, with whom professionally I have actually engaged on a, through a number of years. Um, so I'm going to start with the first introduction and in the middle um, of the panel here to my right is Professor Eamon O'Shea. He is a personal professor in the School of Business and Economics and was inaugural director of the Irish Centre for Social Gerontology at the National University of Ireland in Galway. He holds an MA from UCD in Dublin and an MSc from the University of York and a PhD from the University of Leicester. Um, Professor O'Shea has authored and co-authored 15 books and monographs, mainly in the field of ageing, dementia and social policy. His work has been influential in setting the agenda for the reform of services and policies for people with dementia in Ireland. He was chair of the National Economic and Social Forum Expert Group on Care of the Elderly in 2005 and 2006 and co-authored the influential Creating Excellence in Dementia Care Report in 2012. He is currently a member of the Implementation Group for the Irish National Dementia Strategy. So a warm welcome to Professor Eamon O'Shea. I'm also from Tipperary and extremely nervous about being behind enemy lines. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm, I guess uh, I, I'll do some, some boring bits at the start and uh, just maybe talk a little bit about numbers uh, and uh, things like uh, costs and then talk a little bit about prevention and then talk a bit about where, where the mince is in Ireland at the moment. So to give sort of context, broad context to maybe some of the discussions uh, that you've had already and maybe some of the discussions that other panel members have uh, as well. So, um, the first thing is people with dementia. Sometimes you ask, well, how many people are there here in Ireland with dementia? The answer is we don't really know for sure. Um, we don't do prevalent studies here. So, I've done some estimates and those estimates tell us that there's about 55,000 people who we think have dementia. Age is the predominant predictor of dementia, but, but not always you can have early onset dementia, but age is a good predictor. So the older a country is, the more likely you'll have more people with dementia. The older a county is in age structure, the more likely there are people with dementia there. So age is probably the best predictor we have. So, uh, and that's interesting for planning purposes and for, I always say, to my students when I'm teaching them, just have a look around, look at the old number of older faces there, you can tell straight away, you know, what sort of issues uh, that, that you might want to address in terms of policy. So um, the numbers are going to increase rapidly over the years because uh, the age structure of population in Ireland is getting older. So we're particularly young by European standards, about just 11% of the population are over 65. That's going to go up to European standards over the next 20, 30 years to 18%. So currently you see one in 10 persons over 65, you're going to be close to one in five persons in the next 30 years. 
That's going to be really interesting from the point of view of how we think about the world and how we think about the things we do in the world. So I think it's a really interesting time uh, to address some of the issues. Um, so uh, those numbers then are going to go up. We probably have 100,000 people with dementia within 20 years and 150,000 within 30 years. Uh, these, are, these, these numbers are come with a health warning. We're not that sure, but it, that's likely. Some people worry about costs. Uh, I'm an economist, so I worry all the time uh, about everything. Uh, but some people worry about costs, and some people say, okay, so uh, if this is the numbers of people with dementia, uh, uh, what's the likely implications? And I suppose uh, we've done some cost studies on this. So the current cost say, of care is about $2 billion, just under $2 billion per year. So it costs the economy. The interesting thing is those costs largely fall on informal or family carers. Uh, about half the cost, dementia is not like other diseases, it's not high technology medicine that, 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 that is an issue here, it's just the day-to-day -day caring relationships. So mainly uh, you might think, uh, you know, so these costs are high, what's the structure of care? Typically what happens when you get a diagnosis of dementia and typically what happens you know, in terms of the pattern of care that's around it. Uh, uh, so I mentioned earlier there's 55,000 people with dementia. Probably three-fifths at least of, the, of, people, of those people that I've estimated don't know they have the, the disease. They don't have a diagnosis. Uh, we don't know them. They're not accessing any services that, 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 are, that, that somebody's taking a record of. Yeah, so there's a lot of people uh, uh, out there uh, who really have the disease but, but, but have no structure around them to think about the disease. Similarly, diagnosis. Diagnosis is sometimes hit and miss. It's getting much better. Uh, and a diagnosis sometimes, sometimes uh, not only in this country but in other countries, doctors may be reluctant to give a diagnosis. It's difficult anyway to get a diagnosis. It takes a lot of time. But doctors may be thinking, well, what's the point? Now, that could be associated with some sort of nihilism, some saying, well, you know, what's the point? You know, a person is 75, 85, you know, what's going to change? Or it may be associated with, we don't really have primary care and community care geared towards providing, you know, person-centered, person-led care. We just don't have that at the moment. Um, and so therefore, somebody said, well, maybe you're better off without a diagnosis. That's changing because diagnosis allows you to make really good decisions. And anyway, it's a right, I think, uh, to have a timely diagnosis. But diagnosis allows you to make good decisions and allows you to engage with the process. But, you, but the issue I talked about there about services. So, so therefore, post-diagnostic support, what exists? Well, the answer to that is very little. It's improving. Why is it improving? Well, we do have an Irish dementia strategy, a national dementia strategy, which is really encouraging. Uh, uh, it's encouraging for a number of reasons. It's encouraging because there are two principles written into that strategy. The first principle is one of personhood and the second principle is one of citizenship. So if you took those two principles for what they mean or what we understand what they mean, you would, you would, you would certainly be excited about the potential. The reality is somewhat different, but let's stick with the principles, the principles of personhood and the principle of citizenship. This is a transformative framework for thinking about the world of dementia, if you, if you had this. The principle of personhood comes from Kitwood's, Tom Kitwood's work in the 1990s, where, which emphasized you know, identity, autonomy, the self, the relationship between self and others, the social, and, and that kind of relation, relational space. Rather than the disease, the biological disease, this is a very, this is still new thinking. But it is influencing the way we think about services, we do think about services, and the way we think about some of the things you were discussing today, art, the aesthetics, the relationship of people to other people, all of that is within this frame. But having said that, the, bio, the sort of biological model is still one that it's hard to shift. It's hard to shift the sort of medicalization of the disease. 
but it's a really a necessary shift. It's necessary to move towards some sort of biopsychosocial model where, where the psychology of the disease, the social aspect of the disease is a really critical element of it. So that's going on at the moment. That movement, in a sense, and it is a movement uh, and, and which Ronan is central to, uh, uh, about engagement, that, that, that kind of socialization issue, and about moving the disease in, into the social world. Now, that takes a broader framework also. You have to address a broader framework of basically lack of knowledge. You know, when most of us hear about dementia, it's something, well, I'd rather not hear too much about that, or I don't really want to talk about that because I may be fearful, and, and anyway, I don't know much about it. So we have really to engage and address the issue in a really open way as citizens. You know, we used to have that with many other diseases. We used to have it with cancer, where cancer was a disease where nobody spoke about, and when we did speak about it, we suddenly got more services. We got a strategy. Yeah, so we're moving in that direction where, where we're putting in some money now into understanding dementia, changing attitudes to dementia, because if services are to change, if we're to get services and if we're to get engagement in a really strong public way, we need this to be uh, um, known by the public, uh, known by our politicians. There needs to be pressure on to engage in many different ways. That's beginning to happen as well. No, money has been used through the strategy for that to happen. Sort of on the services side, uh, on the services side, the tendency uh, is to let families deal with it. Remember I gave you a figure earlier, two billion costs, where one billion of that, we estimated, could be ascribed to informal family carers. We, we tend to let, when we do think about services, the old way was simply to think about it in terms of residential care. And about two-thirds, since about, we have about 28,000 nursing home beds. I would say about two-thirds of those beds, uh, uh, there's people with dementia. So, you know, you probably talk about 20,000 people in long-stay residential care. That still leaves 35,000 people out in the community yeah. who needed to be cared for. So we tend to, we tended, tended to sort of medicalize, we tended to institutionalize. Now, we have to go a different route. And that's what my work is really geared towards. It's about opening up primary care, opening up community care, supporting uh, family carers, and principally, through the principle of personhood and citizenship, critically engaging people with dementia directly in the work. Really critical element of finding the voice, hearing that voice, and acting on that voice. So I'm not talking, when I say about, when I say about the you know, home care, or emphasizing home care, I'm not only talking about the traditional services of, you know, your public health nurse, your home health. I'm talking about engaging with people with dementia, listening to their preferences, and, and, and if they say they want to engage more in communities, they want to engage more in the arts, they want to engage more in sport, whatever they want, we have to be able to facilitate that voice. Because even though that voice is weaker, and even though that voice is not always consistent, it is a vital voice. Without it, we can't deliver what we want to deliver. I think what we should deliver, but I think what we want to deliver. So that voice is critical and that engagement. So that's the psychosocial element of care. So when I talk about home care, I'm not talking about simply investment in more, more of the same. We need to change the whole structure of how we think about that engagement. So the voice, first of all, and then a whole myriad of engagements that, 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 that has to happen. So we move from the invisible to the visible. From the excluded to the included. Yeah. From the deficit to the strength. Really critical paradigm shift in the way we think about dementia. These are strong statements if we could, if we could manage to find resources and the structure and the organization to, to reach that. I'll say it again, yeah? From the invisible to the visible, yeah? From the excluded to the included. From the deficit to the strength. Now, finding strengths is not always easy. You know, finding strengths is not always easy whether you have cognitive impairment or not. We tend to look at our deficits much quicker. Now, I can't do this, I can't do that. 
I should do this, I should do that. So what you're trying to do is to say, well, let's focus on the strengths. Let's focus on, on, on and this is what, listening a bit this morning, that I was hearing, you know, the, the, the ability to connect, to find the person, you know, to do that, of course, the one thing that is critical to that is a four-letter word called time. It's precious. It's precious in nursing homes. When I talk to nurses in nursing homes, you know, and, they, and you know, they all want to do what, what, what is right, but they, I don't have the time. I wish I had the time to do some more reminiscence. I wish I had the time to do more dance or whatever. I wish this, but time seems to be so scarce. But it's scarce because the priorities at the moment are different than what they should be. If we prioritize some of the things that I just talked about, then time becomes opens up. You do the same in your own life. By your, by your actions, I, you, I, I know you. Yeah? So when you say, I should be doing this, well, then change the way you're doing things now. <laughs> do things differently. Yeah? So really, this is a critical way of thinking about moving towards doing the things that we... I go back to the strategy. Two words, personhood and citizenship. What words are more transformative? Yeah? But we must now begin to the essence of transforming that, the sort of living that and emphasizing this sort of new paradigm uh, that I talked about. So just briefly, before I summarize it, uh, summarize it because I don't want to go on too, too long, but I just want to give you a snapshot as to where we're at. Um, just some, uh, sometimes people ask me, where are Ireland? Where is Ireland relative to other countries? You know, are we bad at looking after people with dementia? Are we good? Turns out that we've had a lot of investment over the last number of years. We've had about 90 million investment uh, through Atlantic Philanthropies, for example, invested 30 million and then leveraged 60 million uh, more. So we've had a bit of investment. When you look around, you know, the world here is getting much better. Ireland is not, uh, is not lagging that far behind. There are lots of things we could do. This is, a, this is, this is, this is really a time when the next iteration of the dementia strategy will be next year. We have opportunity, those of us who are interested in citizenship, personhood, yeah, in strengths, yeah, in inclusion, in personalization. We have an opportunity over the next year or two to impact on the next five years of investment. It's not, I, I can't say what governments will invest or this or not, but we have an opportunity. Ireland is in a relatively good place in terms of a consensus that the direction of change is the right direction. We don't always follow the resources. But there are, the, the, again, before I summarize, there are a few things that I just want to emphasize. Brain health is a really critical part also of thinking about dementia and thinking also about prevention. Because one of the things, even though we say, can dementia be prevented? Well, n no, in many cases. But we can think about things we can do about brain health and making sure that the, uh, we, 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 we're we really good at thinking about our physical health. We're less good at thinking about our brain health. I was speaking to a crowd of uh, older people. Well, I, I used to say that when I was younger. I, used to, <laughs> I, I was speaking with some older people like myself uh, recently, about 300 of them in a hall. In, uh, uh, and so I said to them, really, multiply 320 by 69. Long, just multiply it in your head. Don't use a calculator. And I said, do that a couple of times a day. It puts down a lot of time and it improves your brain health. You know, just around, so people are used to sort of saying physical health. Make sure you look after your physical health, but make sure you look after your brain health. There are really little things we can think about, which this gives us an opportunity to say the brain matters. And it's really increasingly so. So you know, there are lots of things we can think about and there are lots of the, 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 in terms of exercise as well, healthy body, also contributes to a healthy mind. So there are lots of things we can do beyond simply thinking about, uh, thinking about looking at it when people have the disease. So finally, in summary then, uh, I'm really interested in the arts and dementia. I'm interested for a number of different reasons because I'm interested in the holistic picture of a person, of understanding a person. So when I think about dementia, I, or the word person with dementia, if you concentrate on the first part of that, the person, and you think about their preferences and their needs and what they want and that voice, that can change completely the structure of care. I don't want somebody telling me, 
uh, you know, you need this, you need that, you need a home help, you need to go there, you need to do this. I would say, yeah, I'm quite interested in uh, music. Uh, I'd like really to be, this is what I like to do. I have a story. My story is maybe changed now, but it's really important that you hear the story. I may not be always able to orally present that story, but I can communicate that in many different ways. And that, I think, is as sort of good as introduction maybe to what's going to happen now. And I think that story is really necessary for us to live in a society where, you know, we really are focused on citizenship and person. So I, I, I can answer any, any questions later on. Yeah. Thank you very, very much, Eamon. I think what I've just picked up is just a sense of strength. And, you know, with everybody here in the room, like, we can mobilise that. So uh, please, again, hold your questions, write them down if you need to, and we'll save them for the discussion later. It's with great pleasure that I am introducing Rena Neil to you. For those of you who don't know, she's a dance artist, a curator, and the artistic director of Kithog, for which she has choreographed 11 works. As a performer, she danced for many Irish choreographers, including Fergus O'Cruhur, Finola Cronin, and Rex Levitates, now the Liz, dance, Liz Roach Dance Company. And she was a member of Tan's Theatre Bremen from 2002 to 2006. So she's got great European experience to, to share today. Um, Rhiannach curates the Corporeal Galway Dance Days Festival, a platform for multidisciplinary engagement with dance and social issues in her role as Galway Dance Artist in Residence. She is the dance curator at Firkin Crane in Cork, and she's responsible for artistic programming and development there. She holds a PhD in geography from UCD in 1994, and has guest lectured in Germany, Sweden, and Ireland. Rainet's work with older people, which I think probably is a seed of this, is, I know, it's, Good career, you know. So, but I will I just to just to just briefly summarise the last paragraph. But it, I think it's her work with older people, which was spurred on as a dancer and a choreographer, which has led her to where she is today. So, with great pleasure, I want to introduce Rena. Thank you. Note to self: always give just fifty-word bio. <laughs> Um, I do actually feel like throwing my little bit away and just going, what he said, just <laughs> because I think you expressed so much of what motivates people in this, in this field. Um, so I'm going to realise that I'm going to put, lay my cards on the table and say that I actually do have a vision. Um, and um, it's a vision of like universal access to dance. And it's a vision where dance would be prescribed by GPs, um, both as a prophylaxa, as a preventative, um, but also to mitigate symptoms. Um, and the reason why I've come to that conclusion is I, I spent, I've spent like around the last 10 years dancing with people who used to be older than me, but are rapidly not becoming that much older than me. Um, and also then, as, as you said there, the, the older people get, the, the more that there are incidents of dementia. So I became, I kind of, stumbled on, on this field and then decided I wanted to work very specifically with people who live with dementia. And as a dance artist, what's fascinated me and one thing that motivates me is how much dance and dementia transform each other. Um, that it is a learning experience as well, that an art, an art form itself uh, is transformed by the person practicing it. And that there is a wealth of, um, of, of new kind of horizons um, if we practice dance as we get older in years and if we practice dance um, with different levels of cognition. I also have to preface that my experience is maybe very different to others. Uh, dancing, that coming into like a daycare centre or wherever it is, a group of people, that I have an experience of dementia as with far greater capacity. I've got the experience of, of coming into people who might otherwise, they might be incapacitated at the time, they might be not verbal, they might be sleeping, um, they might be very unsociable. And then simply by dancing, um, I know these people as people who are verbal, motivated, communicative, remembering, uh, joking, and of course creative. And I know this experience is one of 
like great joy on a regular, predictable basis. And I suppose when you talk about personhood, I think that that's, you know, joy is something that maybe we undervalue. But it is what motivates us to be with each other. And I think it is also something that really motivates carers um, who are the forgotten people um, in, 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 in society, um, and whether professional or family. Um, so I've, I've had great joy accompanying people on their journey. Um, I don't have any images because there's great issues of confidentiality and privacy when it comes to, um, to, to dance practice. Um, but first of all, there's kind of an elephant in the room, which is that dance is scientifically proven to be beneficial for physical and mental health, but it's very specifically proven to be beneficial in terms of uh, dementia. And there's this famous uh, long, 25 year longitudinal study. Um, if you Google, it's always the one that comes up. And it's really funny, the newspapers regularly, about every year, uh, refine it and have another headline. Um, but uh, looking at different recreational activities, it was discovered that people who dance regularly, I think three times a week, and it's specifically um, kind of partnering and improvising, um, have a 76% less chance of developing dementia. Really good, isn't it? Um, so dance is um, dan dance works preventatively, so it does work on brain health and physical health, but it also helps mitigate symptoms um, because it's a multifaceted, physicalized art form. Um, the huge health benefits include it uh, integrates several brain functions at once: kinesthetic, cognitive, musical, and emotional. So it increases neural uh, connectivity um, and. Um, Particularly the type of dance that was a dementia prophylaxis that was discovered was partner dancing. Well, you know, normal social dancing, waltzing and the likes, would somebody prefer be tango. But um, specifically, it's uh, freestyle social dancing. Because what happens is, when you're partnering somebody, both people are doing these split-second rapid-fire decision-making. Is he going to stand my toe? Where is she going? All that uh, happening very, very quickly. And it's building new neural pathways and increasing neural capacity. So that basically you're having not just one road to your de destination. And then in terms of, de of dementia, that gives a more flexible brain, gives you more options. Um, and rather than, if you're thinking about dance or any form, that's about rote learned prescribed steps. So it's a kind of an important thing in terms of what dance we should be doing with each other. Now, obviously, partner dancing isn't as popular as it used to be. Hopefully it might come back again. Um, but there's also, with in, in uh, creative dance, there's improvisation. There's also split-second decision, responding to each other, is in creative and improvisational dance. Um, so already then you start to think about what kind of dance, because I'm not trained in social partner dancing, apart from Kaylee, and that's not as, not as split-secondy. Um, and Michael Gans, who uh, was in one of the images he's in, in this project, he's a an absolutely brilliant art practitioner in Germany. He had a huge impact on my approach of what could I use for my dancing to dance with people who are living with dementia. Um, and uh, he's a, a wonderful book, which I would love to have translated um, because he places um, visual art um, within kind of the history of, uh, of so our practice and our, uh, um, the practice of art um, with and by people living with dementia, he places it kind of in the history of, of, of contemporary art. And I realised that actually the history of contemporary dance has already created a space for a person with dementia to dance. Uh, in the 1960s, there was this huge, what we call the Judson Church Revolution. Um, well, I call it revolution, but it's the Judson Church Movement, which basically democratised dance. And instead of thinking about dance as a highly technical, um, kind of step-based or vocabulary-based art form for specialists, we realised that, well, dance can be danced by anybody and anything can be dance. And so normal, everyday movements, pedestrian movements, can be the source of dance. There's also um, Rudolf Laban, who... Um, was practicing the, the early and mid uh, 20th century um, and basically is the father of so many things, it's unbelievable. But also his, his um, focus on dance as movement is also kind of a theoretical basis for, for understanding the, the, the practice and placing it within, rather than sideways to or kind of an addendum, but right in the heart of the development of, of, of the art form, which 
me, I think that's very important, that it's not marginalised, it's not lesser than, but that it's actually up there, avant-garde, cutting edge, that, that it is an integral part of the, of the development of the art form, not just as a health practice. Um, and obviously the key is to consider um, the, the art, a dance practice which is process and not performance based. Because there are challenges, obviously, memory, um, in order to, make the ch to change the practice to make space for someone. Dance, as we know, is an ephemeral art form. And the Swedish choreographer Mats Ek has, has described it as writing on water. The art is stored in the dancer's body and it's accessed through memory. So short-term memory deficits are, can be a huge challenge to dance making. Um, the art, the object that you're creating, or the artwork, is fleetingly transient. So fleeting that perhaps only the observing dance artist is conscious of it as an artistic gesture. So one of my roles I discovered as a dance artist was that as, as a witness. So that I, um, witness and critic even, that I fed back to somebody about what they were doing to, 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 to develop a greater understanding with, with each other about our actions as creative and artistic and aesthetic actions. Um, which then, again, if we go back to that brain function, it means that your you're understanding your movement is a pure function, um, but that, that your aesthetic choices are, are switching on other aspects that you're making. They're very sophisticated choices. And again, it's rebuilding your self-esteem. It's, it's giving you just to make a choice between this and this it has, it has a positive kind of feedback loop. Um, and... Uh, Again, talking about how the art form has been transformed, like about 60 years ago, Merce Cunningham and John Cage consciously uncoupled uh, music and dance. But actually, I didn't actually realize that, that was, that was a really bad pun, I'm so sorry. Um, but, uh, um, but we're actually, we're hardwired for music and dance. And it's hard as a dancer to go, I actually think music is more primary as an art form. I'll just get shot and I can say that. But it's, it's in, what I discovered is that to have dance that is subservient or working with music has a greater, has a greater impact because it comes onto this thing about mnemonic me movement. Movement that unlocks memory. And I've had situations um, that have been just revolutionary in, in, the, in the room. Um, just, uh, for example, uh, one lady... Um, usually had her eyes closed. So if we think of Clive's tics, definitely was ticking all about unengaged, unengaged and uninterested. Um, in fact, would, would walk with her eyes closed rather than, 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 than open to us. And I put on the Blue Danube as uh, just the music in the background as I was saying hello to everybody. And then this lady came up to me and looked at me, she opened her eyes, looked at me, took me, all right, in, into like waltz and waltzed me and then started to smile and started to laugh and she was leading and carers in the room and everybody in the room were admiring her she was beautiful and she was beautiful and the younger people like myself realized we have so much to learn from her she had a skill that we didn't have she flipped the tables over she was the person that we were following and I think that we all kind of had that moment there of going that it's, it has to be constantly reiterated that um, that a person has sophisticated experienced and that you've always got something to learn um, and what that was was then again this the the movement very often it can be where you start off a very simple movement and it triggers off stories in people it triggers off people's memory so our brain is not just here, it's everywhere here. And so using everywhere here allows us to find, I think the, the nurse, the lead nurse that I worked with, used to say that, you'd co that I'd come in and people would come back. That the people would come back and they'd stay back for longer. Um, and then just, uh, I must be nearly finished now, are we? No, just 10 minutes, so you're okay. Oh, am I? I not another 10 minutes. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Time. <laughs> Do it. Um, so I think there's a lot. Basically, there's not enough written about dance in in this in this field. There's not enough. Um, th th it's very very hard to record it and to share it. I think what you did today, Clive, definitely gave me ideas about what can be done. Um, 
because it's also how do you how do you create something like a practice that is transferable um, and a, tra a practice that be can become more universal because we need dance everywhere we really do um, and it's it's so it, so I, I, there's and it's also it's different it is it, it's for everybody but definitely it is a, com a complex simplicity it is some kind of a practice of complex sim simplicity and being having people who are dance artists and performers are an important part of the success of it because you have to hold a space for people in which they can then come out and come into you um, so how much this practice can be codified and replicated is still something I think that's something that is um, you know, that's, a, that's a question that has to be addressed more. There are pioneers, but unfortunately in dance, there's a pioneer here, a pioneer there, and a pioneer there. And every five or six years, there's this kind of revolution of burnout gone, and then people have to reinvent the wheel. Um, so um, I think I'm actually going to, I'm going to actually finish with, um, with, with Michael. Um, so Michael Gantz, uh, again, he, there's this, Model, he, he was talking about this, and I've taken as kind of as a model um, of dementia as an explorer. That we are discovering the world anew, and that our humanness is in our drive to explore, name, and use the world around us, and that we can do that with each other. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rianuk. You beautifully described the moments that I think we all have shared, irrespective of the art form, but it's just so beautifully illustrated through, um, I just pick one description. I just love that idea of, in your case, you talked about dance, but I, if I can put all art, is stored in the body and accessed through memory. So that's a very beautiful quote, just in thinking about the sort of work that we're trying to develop here. Um, and perhaps there are some things that can be replicated, not the individuals, but the practice certainly can be replicated. So we could talk about that too. Thanks so much, Rianuk. So our final um, presentation today is, is by Ronan Smith. And uh, Ronan was diagnosed in 2014 with younger onset Alzheimer's. Ronan was born into a theatrical family and acted as a child in Ortiz Talca Row, and seeing as we're declaring our age, you don't need to put your hands up, those of you who watched Talca Row, but I did, um, and in various feature films since then. He is the son of a distinguished Dublin theatre impresario, the late Brendan Smith. Many theatre goers would be very, have very fond memories of your dad. And he is married to the actress Miriam Brady, who also starred in another pop boiler in the Irish scene, Clive, uh, Glen Rowe. Um, so Ronan cared for his father when he developed Alzheimer's 30 years ago before going on to develop the condition himself. Having studied law after school, he is qualified as a solicitor, but then immediately gave in to his genes and developed a steady career as an actor, a, a director, if some of you may remember Team Theatre Company, important theatre and education company, uh, synonymous with Ronan. Among, among other projects, he has also worked and played a very significant role in the international touring and success of Riverdance, which, as we know, hit the world stage, and in particular, under Ronan's production skills, went to both the West End and to Broadway. He continues to work in theatre in both, in two Dublin theatres at the moment, in the uh, Gaiety and the Olympia. Importantly for today, he is a strong advocate and has recently been appointed chair of the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland's Irish Dementia Working Group. So it's with great pleasure that I invite you to speak to us today, Ronan. Thank you. So I am today's voice of dementia. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to be here today uh, to contribute to this event. Uh, because I regard it as involving two very important aspects of, uh, of life, basically. Uh, the arts in society, which I think to be a very important thing, and the presence of dementia in society. And what excites me about this mix is that the way they might interact. And I think that is pretty much what we're here today to explore. 
my involvement with dementia is obviously close and personal. Uh, having been a care for my father and have traveled through his dementia journey in the 1980s when the stigma was really very strong and very difficult. Um, and I engaged with the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland at that time, um, doing advocacy work then and helping to professionalize the organization, which is a, a remarkably professional organization now at this stage, which I'm pleased to see. Uh, round two of my own uh, Alzheimer journey slowly raised its head, circa, in fact, 2009, and I was formally diagnosed with the condition uh, in 2014. So uh, I'd like to share how I experienced that in a very kind of simple and pragmatic way, just to illustrate how I think how powerfully the arts practice can engage with and can benefit uh, people with dementia and their carers. Um, I'm very aware for myself now at this stage of increasing slow, I'm glad to say, slow and gradual incrementation. But what this, how this um, incrementation uh, reduces my capacity, I'm experiencing that now quite noticeably. And it is, if I can use make up a scientific term, um, it's just my own making, so don't go looking in reference books about it. Uh, the difficulties are around what I would call hard cognition. In other words, uh, the processing of information uh, that you then have to assimilate. It might be new learning, and you have to then uh, try and see how you can apply that learning and what would be the next action. So it's really what I'm trying to say is that the, the hard cognition is the sequencing and retaining of information that's coming at you in a conversation. Uh, and I'm finding that quite difficult now. So, uh, or at least the beginnings of it being difficult. And I would contrast that then with another makey up word of soft cognition. And I think this is where the arts can play a huge role, where you don't have to engage with the nuts and bolts of facts, but you just respond emotionally, you intuit, you automatically reference back your own past experience. And I feel that the exercise of that endeavor is something that will be retained by people as they progress through the dementia condition. And I think that the arts can provide uh, an enormously powerful resource. So what I'm you know, most excited about in terms of today is that I think it can hopefully provide uh, an inspiration for other organizations to really engage with that potential. Um, I've, there are, the reason I feel this is because, of course, there are no right answers in the arts. The arts doesn't work like that. This isn't a matter of learning how to do something. What are the, you know, the construction rules to get from A to B to C to D and the result? Arts doesn't work that way. And I feel very strongly that that gives the arts the opportunity to work with and engage people who are finding it difficult to do the hard cognition and that the uh, arts can provide an enormously rich opportunity for people to engage, to re-engage, um, because there is clearly a very strong inclination for isolation. Uh, I think the people who have the condition uh, are very frequently uncomfortable to talk about the fact that they have it. Um, I think that carers can be very isolated as well uh, and become hesitant to engage. So I feel there's a powerful tool in this room and I'm here to, today to celebrate that. And I hope that you can uh, join in. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ronan.
Um, I have two choices. I can ask some questions of the panel myself, or I can immediately open it to the floor. I'm tempted to do the latter because I think people have been sitting silently for quite a long time. So, you know, there's opportunities to reflect on this morning the, the program that Barbara Ann has outlined, what's happening nationally, uh, Clive's experience and the research, and then more recently, Eamon's, I think, the call for action I am hearing around, you know, a moment is coming for if there's going to be a reconsideration of a strategy for dementia, you know, the arts need to be at the forefront of that. Um, I think, Rianuk, in terms of practice and what can that tell us about an artist's practice, I think it picks up on some of what Clive talked about this morning, the importance for artists, so stroke, facilitated stroke, all those titles, we call ourselves to really look at our own motivation and then to, you know, work our pathway through that, I think, that's really evident in your practice, Marina Cow. You know, some, a motivating factor you've turned into an incredible professional skill and the sort of learnings that we can learn from each other across the arts. And I think then Ronan, you know, the embodiment of somebody who for us can be a guiding and critical friend, which you have been since the outset, certainly of the development of the programme for Azure. Um, and we need to have more voices in the room, more of a variety of voices, uh, critically appraising what we're doing. So... With that, I, I know there's a roving mic somewhere. Would anybody like to break the silence of the big mass of people and go for a question? Or, you know, or a comment. I'll start back, Kieran, and then the woman in red, and then... Hi, I'm, I'm Kieran McKinney. I'm from the Azure Group. And, and it's something you said, Rianuk, about how we store our arts experience in our memory. And then, Helen, what you had said, how it might not just be dance, but it could be all art forms. And, and so I'm really interested in this because one of the things we say about the Azure program is that one of the reasons it works is you don't need memory to, be, to react to a, a, an art piece in front of you. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. so, so I'd really just like to explore that a bit because um, how, how do you see it if somebody, for instance, if they have considerably, you know, considerable memory loss? Um, well, I, I think I said... Uh, that actually your memory is stored in your movement. Okay, so you mean it's a different form of memory? Well, y y yeah, maybe. Yeah? yeah. It's okay. so, or just that particularity of it. Um, uh, that movement can trigger memory. So even with memory loss, there's still, I still have questions about, you know, how we can approach that. I, I do know that... Um, sometimes uh, encouraging or, um, what's it, um, I think it always goes, um, to, to offer um, a movement to somebody, um, very often what happens is you offer a movement and that, that triggers memory that wasn't accessible before. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's what it is, is about looking at different ways to access memories. I know that some memories are definitely gone. It's not that I, you know, I'm not making any magical claims, but um, just f retrieving and using and playing with them, uh, again, just as part of your brain health exercise. And, and that was a new discovery for me that that movement could actually, of itself, do that. Amen. Yeah, Thank you. Want to comment on um, Well, it's just a comment about measurement of. Uh, of some, uh, it's a measurement issue. Uh, so sometimes as researchers and as sort of social scientists looking at programs, be it arts programs, you're asked, is this having an impact or an effect? And it can be very difficult sometimes to measure that impact because sometimes the impact is simply a contemporaneous expression of joy, which is hard to measure with the two. Funny, and funny, <laughs> funny thing to say, but it's hard to measure. It's easier to measure. We have all these scales that measures things. So what happens at the end of the dance program for six months? Are they all feeling quality of life has gone up? And very often, very often what you feel is you can see, you can see, the, you can see the, art, the, the arts intervention having an impact straight away. You can't always measure it in a way that we like to measure sometimes, or you're expected to measure outcome changes. But you can actually see it in faces. We, we, we had the experience of doing a reminiscence program. We, had this, we, saw, this, we saw reminiscence working, but we weren't always getting the measurements at the periods when we actually measured, which actually supported that. So I think it's to, to, to the, 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 you know, the, the enjoyment and the joy sometimes, and I'm speaking more as researchers, we tend, we tend, to, we tend to almost uh, formalize 
in a way that makes it impossible sometimes to measure. Because, you know, so there's, a, there, there's almost a protocol there that, that, that takes that takes that takes some of the, the joy out of it. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to say something? I just feel very much uh, echoing uh, what Eamon's been saying that the the fundamentals of this are experiential, and it you know it really is in the moment of the practice that it happens. And you know we can reflect on it, and we should reflect on it because it's you know useful to reflect on experience. But we actually should simply concentrate on manifesting the experience, and I think it's a matter of accelerating that process. Um, I just feel very strongly that uh, the experience of people living with uh, the condition is one of assault. You know, you do feel. Um, there is something being taken from you, and that's very unnerving. And I think that what can be done is to support people by offering them avenues that are easier than dealing with the nuts and bolts of life that seem now to be very threatening. So, uh, you know, I'm very determined today to keep this simple. Um, you know, there's a lot of science, which is really important because obviously, hopefully, the science will deliver, you know, some kinds of effective treatment uh, in time. In fact, I actually do really strongly believe that that is inevitable. The cure will come. Uh, I don't know when. Um, and uh, I just feel that because, you know, big pharma is going to make a huge amount of money. <laughs> so I think, you know, we have to relax about that. The research is mountainous. It will happen. But in the meantime, I think it's a matter of making the immediate experience as accessible and comfortable as quickly as possible. And if I can speak just, to, you know, as somebody who's involved in Azure and, you know, have spent my whole life, professional life, looking at learning in galleries and in, in the context of learning around artworks, I think, you know, the, the theories around co-constructive learning, about building a community of learners, is, is really what you're talking about. It's about people entering a moment where they're at and then in a community building up that reservoir of both your own memory and the shared memories, or the shared nowness of the experience, which I think is really important, how you feel now about something. So I think it was the lady in red, yeah. Um, I, thank, you. thank you all very much for your presentations, and I'd just really like to make a comment, because um, we're talking about strategy and going forward. So currently, we have a Healthy Ireland strategy, which makes no reference to the arts. We have to change that. Okay, um, we have a Creative Ireland strategy running in parallel. They're the same, they're all together. They need to all be together, be recognized together. It's really important. Um, and the third thing is that people who enter acute care settings have no stimulation. And they're often there in stroke areas or wherever for months. And while there are centers of excellence in Ireland and examples of best practice in acute settings, it is not universally funded. It depends on where you go or where you are. It's not, uh, the access is patchy to say the least. There are reports that are not published. Um, and if we're talking about strategy and recognizing people, that should be a given for everybody in an acute setting, and they are all the one thing because this is something that's innate. And it's like the music, and you're mentioning it, people who don't know their name know the words of songs from years ago. Thank you. Hi, I'm Adele Nolan, and I'd like to reiterate what Bernadette uh, said there. I work in Cork University Hospital, and actually, um, we had a lovely example recently of, um, it's an acute care hospital, we had a lovely example recently of a patient um, suffering with dementia who was in with various um, issues in the hospital, and um, he was very distressed. 
And if we heard about this retrospectively from his family who contacted us, he was very, very distressed on the ward and there was all sorts of issues of security and trying to, you know, help him get his, his treatment, but at the same time help him feel secure. And um, what happened was that he noticed the art on the walls. We have a, we're very fortunate, unlike some hospitals in Cork, we have a huge collection of artworks due to the goodwill of people donating them. Um, they're not bought. So um, he started to notice the art on the walls and started to become very calm. And um, then his family mentioned that he is himself an artist. He's quite well-known graphic artist in Cork. So they started actually bringing him around the hospital. And every time he became agitated, he became very calm then when they went on little tours around the hospital. And um, he he reported to his family that um, he, he thought he was at an exhibition. And this was fantastic. So they used the art immediately as a way to help him feel safer in hospital so he could get the health care he needed. And then his, his wife contacted us and said, as they were going around, he noticed some walls where they were blank. And he said, why isn't the exhibition here? Why is this wall blank? So he said, I could donate some of my art here. So they contacted us and we um, met, I met with them and they, uh, he has a wonderful collection of art, which we're now going to accept. And then we invited him to do uh, to exhibit with us as part of the launch of that artwork for Culture Night this year. So it's a lovely project I just wanted to share with you. And we had something similar a couple of years ago. Brother Ambrose O'Mahony, he's a, a well-known Cork artist as well from the Franciscan community. And he donated 46 artworks to the hospital and we had an exhibition there. And actually, sadly, he, he did die in the hospital, but it was a nice experience for him and the Franciscan community because he was you know, surrounded by his own artwork at the time and uh, people who came to visit him from, from all over Cork were remarking, oh, you know, here's a piece of his art as they were going to see him and say their fa farewells. Now, he was, you know, older gentleman, so um, it was a celebration of his life, really. So uh, I just wanted to share those two projects, which are you know, timely because it reiterates what Berndish was saying, that having art in hospitals is hugely beneficial. And as the population is aging, as was spoken about, you know, it's going to become more important. But how to access the funding for that to happen? Because artists, you know, are kindly giving their artwork, but really they need to be remunerated for the work that they're doing rather than just gestures of goodwill. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Gillian Cusson. I work as an artist on the um, Lunra programme in Crawford, um, but I've also worked um, with Fuse Music Alive, which kind of relates to um, what you were saying there, um, which was a three-year project, which is finished now, but we worked in, sorry, in specialist um, residential settings and hospital settings. Um, but I want to just ask a little question um, concerning private nursing homes. I've been working for about eight or nine years in a number of private nursing homes in County Cork, and um, I'm struck by the lack of personhood, and I was just wondering if there was any possibility of the fair deal money which goes into the private institutions, if that could be somehow regenerated or redirected, and it's specifically to you, Eamon, really, this question, into um, enabling people to stay at home where the vast majority of people want to unless they necessarily need you know, specific nursing home care. Because I know when I'm at an age where I might need some type of care, I, I think I would prefer to be around things I love, doing things I like to do, and with people I love. I'm just wondering if, on a more, I suppose, a national level, if, if you know, strategically, could be looking at that so that things like the arts could be incorporated in people's lives, because I know nursing homes say they, they employ artists, but most of them don't really. People go on a very short course um, and they call themselves artists, but it's having somebody from the outside coming in, which is, is really good for those who have to be in institutions like that. So just wondering. So, so there's a couple of aspects to that question. So there's good news um, about, um, certainly there's movement now, within the next year, there should be a rights-based, home-based care uh, you know, um, system in place. So there is a movement towards, towards 
uh, addressing the issue of the weakness of home-based care in making you know services available by right to people. You know, there'll be an issue of funding and co-payments and issues like that, I'm sure, down the line, but there will be, I think there will be, it seems to be the direction is towards a kind of some fair deal scheme for home-based care, which will be, I think, absolutely critical in terms of moving us to the next stage that I, uh, that I talked about earlier, and one of the reasons for optimism is that that, that, that can happen. Um, so hopefully more of us will be able to stay at home, um, but there's a lot of work to be done in changing the mindset still uh, for that to happen. But you know, the second part of your question is about um, nursing home care and about what we value. So um, I would have done a year's work uh, in 2008 or 9 in nursing homes and looking at quality of life and so on like that. And some of the issues you raised there would have been absolutely there. You know, uh, a lack of focus on, on, on quality of life, I suppose, as much as quality of care. So the care, you know, I think quality of care is sometimes different than quality of life. And I think that the sense of what produces quality of life, sort of I'm a I, I have an interest in health production. I know it sounds like an economic term, but it is an economic term. But I have an interest in how health is produced internally and externally. And I think health, our health is, is, is that, that process is a very complex process. And it requires many different things. And one is what you just described, our relationship and engagement. We talked about identity and self and, 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 and an acquaintance with some of the all the things we value during our life, you know, they don't disappear just because we're admitted to a long stay care. I think one of the issues is to, is to, I would say, compel that that sort of engagement more in residential care. You know, there are really good residential care units, really good, but I think it's the task is to make sure that that engagement you're looking for becomes normal. It's part of the normal process, and it's part of the regulated process. No, I, I know you can, yeah, I'm saying you can shake your head and say, absolutely, I, I, I've worked in this area for 30 years, so I've been in more nursing homes than, than I should ever have had to go into in my life. And I'm really aware of the, you know, the absence of this. But it's not impossible to regulate for this. It's not impossible to incentivize for this. It's not, behavioral change happens when you incentivize. You don't get behavioral change, as we all know in our own lives, unless you actually provide incentives for that to happen. You can do that through, through regulation, but you can also do it through you know, uh, the good ones and giving them more if they do the thing. So, so I think you're absolutely right in, in pointing that out. Um, but I think there are lots of things we can do. Could, could I? Yeah. No, could I just uh, piggyback on this to say that you know, the, the introduction of home care packages is uh, something that the ASI is extremely keen to see happen. And we do a lot of uh, advocacy about that, and there's an all-party doll committee, and we you know, troop down and go in Marion Square and meet up with them again and again and again, uh, as one has to do. Uh, but uh, certainly it does seem to be something that needs political pressure and this you know political pressure really comes from the grassroots so just while we have a room full of people who are clearly interested uh, I would just suggest that you know ring up the local TD go to the clinic and say what about home care packages because that is how change happens it doesn't happen without the footwork so you know in all your conversations with other people who are concerned who have uh, dementia somewhere in their lives that this is a change that can be made. Uh, everybody in the political s sphere professes to believe in the importance that there be home care packages, but nobody's doing anything because it's very complex. There's a lot of complex problems to be faced in setting it up and administering it and implying, you know, the same, some sort of familiar fair deal arrangement of some kind that would apply to home care packages, not just to residential care. So uh, it is this, unfortunately, you know, boring business of uh, getting engaged with the political system. And that's what will make things change. And it's really important that that happens. And if I could add, um, just with respect to, I think, engaging with the political system and then continuing to develop 
models of good practice and develop partnerships. It, you know, Azure wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had, you know, the strength of the partnership that has led it through. And more recently, because of our physical locations, IMA, it, the Irish Museum of Modern Art is talking to, and we're beginning to share a programme with the Mercer's Institute for Successful Ageing in St. James's Hospital, which is just across the road. And we're looking at possibly the potential of social prescribing. So we're going to try and test, at least small scale, but if we can test some ideas out, and if that can be, as you've been doing, Rena, for years, and others have been doing at local level, and then you know, mobilize it at national level, and if we can link into that dementia strategy, um, a few lines. And I think it's really valid what you've said about Creative Ireland. You know, again, it just strikes me that one of the pillars in Creative Ireland is this pillar for about the child and creativity, and they're talking about um, having arts-rich schools. Now, I have to say that was started before Creative Ireland by a mobilisation of teachers who believe in, in introducing the arts at primary school level and at second level. But what about having a similar arts-rich environments for all citizens, wherever we find ourselves? So, you know, we can play one, complement one initiative, I think, with another. Sorry, I've just seized the moment of the mic. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, say something to Gillian. Um, I'm the activity coordinator in St. Joseph's in Mount Desert in Cork. And I'm not an artist, um, but I am starting to learn. And you know, you're saying that people go in and that they're not artists. But I did the creative exchange course. And uh, Barbara Ann, I was part of a session that Barbara Ann gave, which was absolutely fantastic. And I've gone on to do an art exhibition where I work because of Barbara Ann, um, with the cooperation of everyone eventually. Um, and then did Art Looking, which again was from Barbara Ann. It was phenomenal. And I'm not an artist, but what I want to say is that you can learn. And, you know, I've learned a lot about myself, learning about art uh, uh, and learning about art to enable uh, people with dementia to enjoy themselves. And I like the idea of keeping it simple. You know, you know, it, it doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, the Creative Exchange course is fantastic. And it enabled me to do lots of things within the arts, you know. So <coughs> it can be done, you know. So, and it is being done. <laughs> Take it away. Thank you. And, you know, I, and I think that's wonderful. And I'm sure your, your exhibition was really good and what you're doing um, but I've seen people in similar situations to yourselves who mightn't have as much of an interest and who are working maybe full-time in as maybe a care assistant or as an activities coordinator and because you're in the environment all of the time you become part of the environment if you know what I mean part of the institution and I feel sometimes it needs um, people from the outside who bring a fresh just something different and um, to actually come into the institution or home care or residential care unit. Um, I just think it adds a different favour. Yeah, well, that's great. Yeah, <laughs> great. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> Part of the problem is you're a lone person working on your own. You need people, you know, you need volunteers, uh, you need more staff, you need care assistants to change their attitudes. It's a whole big package, really. But it, we're getting there, you know. Thank you both. Um, more, more to be discussed and action. Thank you very much for that. There's just on that area. point, I, my name is Ursula Payne. I worked with the HSE for 34 years. We built a brand new, beautiful community nursing unit in Thurlis in 2006. We had artwork on the walls. We had metalwork on the walls. And then lo and behold, on comes Hikwa and says, they all have to go. They're all hazards, dust collectors, no cushions, no teddy bears, no wall art. Please take those down. So that was a bit disillusioning as obviously quite a bit of money had been spent on that. I left the HSE and I went on to open a small Alzheimer's daycare unit in the town purely with the support of community social services and activities-based care for people with Alzheimer's and any other form of dementia. We do the dance, but to me, what triggers the dance is the music. 
And if the music triggers the memory, the dance will come as long as mobility is there. So if I play the Hucklebuck, then somebody will get up and twist or shake or do the Hucklebuck. And in the same way, we also have volunteers who come in, volunteer artists who come in to do art sessions. But again, as Eamon says, it's person-centered. So if they don't want to do it on the day, then they're not, people are not obliged to do it on the day. So, you know, it, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of activity, and it's a lot of input, and a lot of support required. And this year, after three years, we're going to get part funding for the daycare from the HSE West. Mm -hmm. So I'm delighted. Is there somebody else? Uh, do you want to say something? I mean, there, there was a few things that you said there. Yeah, definitely there's that question about HSE and HICWA um, cases where I'm a highly qualified, highly trained, highly experienced dance practitioner who has lifted men your height and have situations in which I've been told, no, people who can walk, I can't actually dance with them when they're standing. Everybody has to participate sitting. So we have an issue in this country that's not just with us, it's with everything. We have handed over our autonomy, our wills, everything to ridiculous rules. And the only way, in Germany, you have common sense law. Well, again, you said it. We have to start walking into our TDs, it's often and going, we're not taking this anymore. I refuse to be, my life ruled by some stupid insurance rule. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one, that is a massive problem. Artwork considered a dust collector and moving your body considered a trip hazard. <laughs> but there is also a thing, there is, there's also about the professionalization of arts practice with, with communities of interest, specific communities. It's, I think that what's needed is a network. There are people who are primarily carers and activity coordinators who can facilitate arts practice, but there's, nothing can replicate somebody who's spent their life training at it and practicing it. Um, yes, dancing to music is one thing, but it's not, it's not all dance. It's only one thing. And the, 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 as I say, I use that term complex simplicity because from the outside it can look very simple, but it's not. What is happening is very complex. Yeah, I think it's our responsibility to, to explain that better. But artists, you use, use the word volunteer artists. Well, all of this sector is subvented at uh, billions by professional artists working for pittance. And it's never going to get any better until it, we're actually, what we do is recognized. So, uh, I mean, I'm going to bring some economics in here now. Oh, God. <laughs> so, so one of the things I think you have to do is also to, to demonstrate that, you know, some of the things that you just described are really produce good outcomes. And I think you need to link the good outcomes to, you know, to an investment and value associated with it. If you want, I know, and I'm, I'm not, so, so the way this works is, as far as I can see after 30 years, is that, uh, there's a view that, that family carers should look after people, free. There is a view then that, that the service itself should be provided at as low as cost possible. So what we have to do is to try to change the view that this is, you know, a, a, decent, a decent society, provides high quality care. You know, it, there are costs associated with high quality care. There's no point in fooling ourselves. You know, if we want to produce a high a quality of life, and if we value quality of life, in all its meanings, right up to the end of life, then it has implications. It has implications for our tax system, it has implications for our financing system, and it has implications the way we pay for care, whether it's really high quality carers, yeah, who are doing incredibly valuable jobs, uh, or whether it's artists who are trying to impact on quality of life in a way that's meaningful for the person. All of these, you know, and I think one of the things is that sometimes, you know, don't forget that 
you know, don't forget to try to value what you do. So, for example, I'll just give you a quick example. You know, some people, some people talking about uh, people in acute care. We calculated that a person, people with dementia in acute care, because because dementia is not really recognised within acute care systems, they end up spend, spending longer days in hospital. So they spend. So if you go in for you know five days of appendectomy, if you have dementia, you'll probably end up spending eight or nine days. You know, I'm just giving that as an example. Yeah. If you go in with heart, with heart problem, if you have dementia, you'll end up because you know your dementia hasn't been recognised and, and it hasn't been addressed. So we calculated it costs about 200 million extra a year simply because dementia hasn't been recognised, and that recognition can be through that arts engagement of the you know the the, the in in. Um, Simply, simply having some engagement, and it could yield returns multiple times the cost of of dance or pictures or or, or whatever. So I think I think we've got to be smart as well in terms of saying, you know, we do bring we do bring something here, and it's trying to document that. I suppose is often the task that I'm asked to do, and it's, it's a tricky one, but 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 it's necessary to do it. I, we're just, I have somebody going clearly time, but there are two people, if you don't mind, it, this conversation can go on after this, but there's a man here, I think, and is there somebody else, Barbara? So I'm going to wrap it up, unfortunately, after your input, so thank okay, you. Okay, I'm going to keep it short. Um, I'm Olivier from uh, Belgium, from the Flanders Centre of Expertise on dementia, and actually I can build further on what the professor is um, was talking about, the whole financial um, um, picture of art interventions. Um, what we're struggling um, a lot on is, um, of course, we're all convinced here that it has added value for quality of life and so on, but how can you um, measure the, the, the financial impact or the potential financial rewards of um, um, art interventions? And if I understood Clive right during his presentation, he said for each pound, you're investing in art interventions, you get between three or six pounds back, or if, if I understood that right. Um, and I was just wondering if he could explain that a bit further, or if the professor could say some more about that. I, I'm behind you, so I'll walk forward. That's what happens when you go okay. to the toilet. So. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm slightly terrified by your question. This, this isn't the last question. This can't be the last question. One of the things I said um, when I was giving the presentation is, please, nobody ask me about the financial... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, but, but, so, but I mean... Cost-benefit analysis is the crude term. In, in England, and I'm not talking about Ireland, in England, the Treasury have something called a green book. And the green book justifies all spending that the Treasury make. Um, and the Treasury now say that they're happy to take into account social return on investment. So I can't give you the measurements, I can't give you the proxies, I can't give you any of the fine detail, because that was the okay. question I dreaded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, yeah. But, um, you know, but my, my point was, yeah. sorry, I interrupt you. I mean, in Flanders now, we're starting a, a national working group on art and dementia. And obviously, in the end, it's a question of long-term sustainability. And what we see in Flanders, and what I notice here also, of all the people talking, there are lots of good projects, locally based. Um, it, it's a matter of sharing good practices. But in the end, we think you need something more to really make them sustainable and, and to implement them structurally in, in care. And that's why I was yeah. a little bit advocate of the devil. I mean, yeah, so. absolutely. But, and, and my way... <laughs> I came away from Belgium, so... Yeah. My, my, um, my kind of longitudinal answer to that is um, not an economic one. It's coming back to what a few of the speakers have said on the platform, which I've really enjoyed but which provokes me to think we need dementia activism. We've had queer rights, we've had uh, Black Lives Matter in America. We ha where there are movements where people are actively on the streets, where they're actually saying, this isn't right, we've got to do something about it, and it turns into social justice and activism, change is made. You know, but if people don't express themselves, nothing's made. In the UK, um, we have an all-party parliamentary group for arts and health. Sounds really boring. It's not, because... We've done what a, f a couple of you have suggested on the panel. We've lobbied our politicians because we vote for them. They're responsible for us. They're our servants. You know, you want change to happen, force your MPs to put the money where their mouth is, make them responsible for championing our cause. So 
I'd throw it right back to the politicians, I'd throw it right back to the economists, and I would say there's ample evidence out there to show that sort of the kind of things we're talking about, if it's high quality, if it's sustainable, has a profound long-term effect on health and well-being, and by proxy has to on the economic purse. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Do Okay, we are mid-conversation and mid-sentence, but I just really want to thank everybody for start to thank everybody in relation to your participation from the floor. Um, it's been great to start the debate. I think there's some really important things emerging. Um, it's great that this is in the context of European Learning Project, Barban. Um, great recognition of a, a movement that we know is worldwide, and uh, in an Irish context. There's some important moments, I think, to capture. I think the call to rally, to actually be active, to activate, to look at that dementia strategy, to support artists and arts work, and to respect the professions. I don't think there was anybody who was saying it should be either or. I think any work, interdisciplinary work, and interprofessional work, there's some learning sometimes to place everybody on that continuum. But if it's a continuum of practice, and importantly, a continuum of quality of life. And what I picked up very much is at the center of it is each of us as individuals and the individual's right to have a good quality of life. So I just want to thank Rianoch, Eamon and Ronan very sincerely for stimulating the debate this morning. Thank you. And thank you to Helen also for fantastically chairing what I think could have been a conversation that could continue well into the afternoon. But thank you, Helen. Thank you.